Greetings, and bienvenue, Midna crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Legends and regional folklore. Tall tales, monsters, urban legends, weird history. This thread is for sharing any interesting stories that might fall into the X domain. I'll personally be sharing a few legends of the Wild West that I found interesting. I'll also post a bio on the Wendigo since I know lots of people on this board find that sort of thing interesting, as well as other monsters. First up, I'll be sharing the legend of Goatman's Bridge. Located seven miles south of Denton, Texas is the old Alton Bridge. Yes, it's picturesque. Yes, it's historic. But this is X, so let's get to the weird stuff. The bridge, said to be haunted by the Goatman, is known locally as Goatman's Bridge. The backstory is actually pretty interesting. The bridge was built in 1882. Fifty years later, a black guy named Oscar Washburn settled near the bridge with his family. He earned his living raising goats, which earned him the name Goatman. He was an honest fella, and his business did really well. Unfortunately, there were those who didn't take too kindly to successful black men in their neck of the woods. Pick related, KKK members depicted in Harper's Weekly, 1872. So imagine how they felt when Washburn posted a sign on the old Alton Bridge advertising his business. This way to the Goatman. Klansmen were pissed, and late one August night they planned to cross the bridge and murder Washburn, Pick related. They drove over the bridge with their headlights off, so as to avoid being seen from a distance. They burst into Washburn's home and dragged him from his home up to the bridge. The Klansmen fitted a noose over Washburn's head and pushed him over the side of the bridge. But when they looked over to make sure he was dead, they only the rope. Washburn had vanished. He was never seen again. The Klansmen figured if they couldn't kill the Goatman, they'd kill his family. And that's just what they did. His wife and kids were all murdered in cold blood. Afterwards, people began to experience weird things on that bridge. Some reported hearing hoofbeats on the bridge with no horses anywhere nearby. Other claimed to have seen a ghostly man herding goats over the bridge, while still others encountered a spectral man that stared at them. Even weirder strange stories of people seeing a half-man, half-goat creature on the bridge began to circulate. Over time, people began to believe that the Goatman haunts the bridge. It's said that if you cross the bridge at night with your headlights off, you'll meet the Goatman on the other side. But X will probably never know, since the bridge has been closed to vehicle traffic since 2001. But for those of you daring enough, I'll include this little bit of folklore. They say that if you go there on Halloween and honk your car horn twice, you'll see the Goatman's glowing eyes. Pick related, Goatman's Bridge. And speaking of glowing eyes, let me give y'all a nice little rundown on the Wendigo next. Let's go to an Ojibwe scholar on the subject. Basil Johnston describes the Wendigo like this. The Wendigo is gaunt to the point of emaciation. Its desiccated skin is pulled tautly over its bones. Its eyes, which are pushed back deep into their sockets, are sometimes said to glow. The Wendigo looks like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had are now tattered and bloody. It gives off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition, of death and corruption. Basil Johnston, Ojibwe teacher and scholar. The Algonquian legend describes the creature this way. A giant with a heart of ice, sometimes it is thought to be entirely made of ice. Its body is skeletal and deformed with missing lips and toes. Another Ojibwe source. It was a large creature as tall as a tree with a lipless mouth and jagged teeth. Its breath was a strange hiss, its footprints full of blood, and it ate any man, woman, or child who ventured into its territory. And those were the lucky ones. Sometimes the Wendigo chose to possess a person instead, and then the luckless individual became a Wendigo himself, hunting down those he had once loved and feasting upon their flesh. According to the legends, a Wendigo is created whenever a human resorts to cannibalism to survive. Other stories speak of a gigantic spirit, over 15 feet tall, that had once been human but was transformed into a creature by the use of magic. Sometimes they're depicted as gluttonous and fat, and other times as emaciated from starvation. In either case, the creature is a near-perfect hunter that knows and uses every inch of its territory. And worse, it can control the weather through the use of dark magic. There's also a cool document that mentions some people overcome by Wendigo psychosis. It's from the Jesuit relations and dates back to 1661. They had sent some men out to rendezvous with a native tribe, but the men never returned. 
They met their death the previous winter in a very strange manner. Those poor men, according to the report given us, were seized with an ailment unknown to us, but known to the natives we were seeking. They are afflicted with neither lunacy, hypochondria, nor frenzy, but have a combination of all these disease. It affects their imaginations and causes them to develop a canine hunger. This makes them so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men, like veritable werewolves, and devour them voraciously, without being able to appease their appetite, always seeking fresh prey. The more they get, the more they want. This illness attacked our men, and as death is the sole remedy among natives for such a condition, they were slain in order to stay the course of their madness. Tons of people were overcome with this apparent insatiable appetite for human flesh. A famous case involves a Cree Indian fella named Swift Runner. He and his family were starving during the winter of 1878, along with lots of other families, and his son eventually died of starvation. Swift Runner very quickly made the decision to eat him. The rest of his family was disturbed by this, so then he ate them too. Pick related, Swift Runner on the left. At the same time, there were stories of a Wendigo being spotted near a town called Rosa Sioux in northern Minnesota. People claimed to see the creature on and off from the late 1800s well into the 1920s. Each time that someone reported seeing it, an unexpected death followed until finally, it was seen no more. Then there was Jack Fiddler, an OG Cree chief and medicine man known for his skills in defeating Wendigos. Fiddler claimed to have defeated 14 Wendigos during his lifetime. Some of these creatures were said to have been sent by enemy shamans, but some were just tribe members overcome with a desire to eat human flesh. In this case, Fiddler was usually asked by family members to kill a very sick loved one before they became a Wendigo. This was done according to a specific ritual. Pick related, Jack Fiddler is the second from the right hands on his hips. There are many who still believe that the Wendigo roams the woods and the prairies of northern Minnesota and Canada. In fact, Wendigo sightings are still reported in northern Ontario, near the so-called Cave of the Wendigo. It's been seen around the town of Kenora by traders, trackers, and trappers for decades. In fact, many have said that Kenora, Ontario, Canada is the Wendigo capital of the world. Now I'll shift gears. I'm a fan of legends about the West because often they're very tragic. This next one is one such story. It's about buried treasure, and the people who met unfortunate ends in an effort to unearth it. Not exactly folklore, but I was just reading a newspaper and got this. What is the most impressive thing you have had to see? I was doing an exorcism and in the person's hand a pentagram begins to be drawn, as if an invisible needle was drawing in his hand and I saw how it was appearing. I put my hand on him, I prayed, and when I pulled out my hand was already gone. Another time I had a family where they were all possessed, father, mother and daughter. The doors were closed to them and later they could not be opened. The daughter was hanged, her hair was cut in half. They hit them with balls when there were no balls in the house. One day it began to shake very loudly and they ran out of the building, and once outside they realized that it had not trembled anywhere other than in their apartment. And there was another time that the husband couldn't find his wallet anywhere, for days, until he looked at the ceiling and saw that it was stuck there, as if gravity had been reversed. We passed him a broom to get it out and he wouldn't move, until suddenly it fell to the ground. That is irrational, it overcomes all logic. Luis Escobar, The Clinic, 05 de Marzo, 2020. The Cursed Gold of Cahuenga Pass. In the Santa Monica Mountains is a low pass said to be the site of a mysterious and fabled lost treasure. A treasure supposedly cursed by dark forces. It goes like this, it's 1864. The President of Mexico sends four agents to San Francisco to buy weapons so he can wage war against French forces. The men are carrying $200,000 in gold as they travel along the Cahuenga Pass towards their destination. Pick related a drawing of Cahuenga Pass. One of the men dies very suddenly during the journey, a sign of the many deaths to come in connection to this gold. When the group finally reaches San Francisco, they find it heavily infiltrated by the French. They decide to lay low for a while. Dividing the treasure into six portions, the men bury it all in different locations until they figure out what to do. What the men didn't know was that they weren't alone out there. A shepherd named Diego Moreno was watching them from afar, and when the men left, he dug up the treasure for himself. Naturally, when they return and find the gold gone, they start pointing fingers. Things get heated and weapons are drawn, shots are fired, and in the end, all of the men die. 
In the meantime, Moreno stops off at a tavern along the Cahuenga Pass, and after a few drinks, he goes to sleep nearby. That night, he has a dream. In it, he's warned not to carry the treasure any farther or he'll die. Moreno wakes up in a cold sweat, frightened by the strange premonition. So he decides, I'll bury it under this tree over here and just come back later for it. But it's not in the cards. Soon after that, Moreno falls violently ill. His friend, a man named Jesus Martinez, looks after him, but Moreno dies. However, not before telling Martinez about the gold and its whereabouts. Martinez and his stepson, Jose Correa, decide, what the hell, let's go see if he was telling the truth. They find the spot and begin to dig into the earth, when suddenly Martinez is struck by a heart attack. He dies there on the spot. The very young Correa is scared out of his wits, thinking that maybe the gold is cursed. He leaves it where it is and never tells a single soul about it or its secret location. However, in 1885, some of this gold was apparently found by accident when a Spanish shepherd stumbled across just one of the six buckskin sacks containing the gold. He's quite pleased, and he sails back to Spain with his hoard. He sewed it all within his clothing to keep anyone from stealing it. But then, just as the ship is approaching the Spanish coast, the shepherd falls overboard. He quickly sinks, weighed down with the gold and drowns. Fast forward to 1895. Correa is now a grown man, and he decides he isn't scared of curses anymore. He's determined to claim the stash, but once more the curse of the gold strikes. The night before Correa goes to dig it up, he dies in a shootout with his brother-in-law, taking the secret of its location to his grave with him. To this day, nobody knows where it is. Up next, I want to tell you about the Hand of Glory. The Hand of Glory. The Hand of Glory is a grotesque, magical item. Traditions vary, but basically the object is the actual disembodied hand of a hanged criminal. The left hand is preferred, but if the he was a murderer, then the right hand works just as well. So basically you cut off the criminal's hand and then you drain it of blood, dry it, and pickle it. Then a candle is made from the rendered fat of a different felon, preferably someone who was hanged. This candle is then set within the dried, pickled hand of the first criminal, and now you have a hand of glory. Here is an actual recipe for creating one of these things. It comes from an occult grimoire from 1722 called the Petit Albert. Take the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet beside a highway. Wrap it in part of a funeral pall and squeeze it well. Then put it into an earthenware vessel with zemet niter, salt and long peppers, the whole well powdered. Leave it in this vessel for a fortnight, then take it out and expose it to full sunlight during the dog days until it becomes quite dry. If the sun is not strong enough, put it in an oven with fern and vervin. Next, make a kind of candle from the fat of a gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame and pony and use the hand of glory as a candlestick to hold this candle when lighted, and then those in every place into which you go with this baneful instrument shall remain motionless. Pick related, a hand of glory. There are many variations. In some stories the hand has no candles at all or the hand must come from a child or a virgin. Sometimes the whole act must be done under a lunar eclipse, etc. Whatever the method, in the end you're left with a dried and pickled hand. So then you might ask, what's the point of making one? Hands of glory are most commonly mentioned in the lore as being of great use to thieves. When the proper incantation is recited, they supposedly have the power to open any locked door, make the person holding it invisible, cast a magical light that can only be seen by the person holding it, paralyze those in its vicinity. There's a cool story about the Hand of Glory from an 1873 book titled Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. The story tells of a cloaked beggar who comes out of a storm into a small inn. There are no rooms or beds available, but the stranger is allowed to sleep at the fire next to a servant girl. At some point during the night, the servant girl wakes up and sees the beggar pulling out a withered human hand from beneath his cloak, after which he lights some candles between its gnarled fingers, mutters an incantation, and starts throwing valuables from the inn into a sack. The girl tries to wake others in the house to warn them of what is happening, but finds them all in a deep sleep from which they cannot be roused. Taking matters into her own hands, she approaches the thief and tries to put out the flames, but finds that they won't go out no matter what she does. That is, not until she finally douses them with milk, at which point the flames go out, the others wake up and the thief is apprehended. The there are many variations. In some stories, the hand has no candles at all or the hand must come from a child or a virgin. Sometimes the whole act must be done under a lunar eclipse, etc. Whatever the method, in the end you're left with a dried and pickled hand. 
So then you might ask, what's the point of making one? Hands of glory are most commonly mentioned in the lore as being of great use to thieves. When the proper incantation is recited, they supposedly have the power to open any locked door, make the person holding it invisible, cast a magical light that can only be seen by the person holding it, paralyze those in its vicinity. There's a cool story about the Hand of Glory from an 1873 book titled Curious Myths of the Middle Ages. The story tells of a cloaked beggar who comes out of a storm into a small inn. There are no rooms or beds available, but the stranger is allowed to sleep at the fire next to a servant girl. At some point during the night, the servant girl wakes up and sees the beggar pulling out a withered human hand from beneath his cloak, after which he lights some candles between its gnarled fingers, mutters an incantation, and starts throwing valuables from the inn into a sack. The girl tries to wake others in the house to warn them of what is happening, but finds them all in a deep sleep from which they cannot be roused. Taking matters into her own hands, she approaches the thief and tries to put out the flames, but finds that they won't go out no matter what she does. That is, not until she finally douses them with milk, at which point the flames go out, the others wake up, and the thief is apprehended. The People have claimed to see a strange, imposing figure with glowing eyes inside a cave in Arizona. The cave sits under the Squaw Peak mountain range, and there's actually a cool history behind it. In 1868, a group of white men traveling through the Squaw Peak Mountains stumbled upon a group of Tonto Indians in a cave. The white men shot the group unhesitatingly, firing into the dark recesses of the cavern. When the massacre was over, the hunters rode away over the mountains. However, something else happened that night after the white men left, according to legend. The moon shone its light into the cave and one of the corpses rose up and walked over to a rock at the cave entrance. The corpse sat down upon the rock and it sits there still, guarding the cave for all of eternity. One guy who ventured into this area later claimed to have been confronted by a thing, as he called it, that scared him so badly that he fled in terror. After him, two prospectors attempted to explore the cave, but the entrance was barred by the thing. They described it as having a torn face with bulging eyes and yellow teeth. It had long hair and moldy flesh. The prospectors naturally ran away with one of them later saying, there's not enough money in Maricopa County to pay me to go there again. I'd like to see it for myself personally. How about one about a gargantuan toad? In the very remote mountains of the Hubei province, central China, are lots of deep water gorges and lakes. Quite pretty actually. Too bad they're said to be inhabited by enormous pale white man-eating toads. The most famous of these was quite notorious among local fishermen and even had a name, Chan. This Chan was a huge nuisance, attacking anything that came near its watery abode, including pets. The locals decide something has to be done. According to the reports, the fishermen tried using explosives to get rid of Chan once and for all, but this backfired when the toad chased them for a long ways, snapping at them with its huge mouth. It's uncertain what happened to Chan after this. The fishermen just stopped going near that particular spot from then on. In 1987, a professor led an expedition into the area, along with nine other scientists. They weren't there to find monsters, just to catalog aquatic life. Nevertheless, monsters they found. The report goes that they were setting up camp at one of the area's many deep water-filled gorges, when three immense albino toads with mouths six feet wide bobbed to the surface and began swimming towards them. The scientists looked on, totally bewildered, and then one of the toads lashed out with its tongue, it managed to snag a camera tripod, which it then tried to eat. Then all of the toads let out this unearthly shriek before descending back down into the murky water, leaving the team completely shocked at what they had just witnessed. The next story will be about a ghostly ship that seems to be a portent of death. So this story comes out of Wyoming. The sightings of the ghostly ship are localized along the Platte River, pick related. As you can see, much of it is surrounded by trees, and it was through these trees that a trapper named Leon Weber was walking one day, when suddenly a mist settled over the whole area. Weber was caught off guard and he stood there a moment, looking around him. The mist became a heavy, rolling fog, and suddenly he saw a ship emerge from the fog on the river. It was relatively close to where he was standing, and he watched as it approached him, closer and closer. He could see the crew on deck looking in his direction, as though watching him. So now we have Weber watching the crew. As the crew stares back at him ominously, 
when suddenly the crew steps back to reveal a body lying on the deck, apparently dead. Intrigued and disturbed, Weber continues watching the ship as it approaches until finally he can see the face of the dead person. It's his fiance. Weber is mortified and he can hardly move as the ship sails past him back into the fog, at which point the fog dissipates and Weber scrambles out of the area and races home. Lo and behold, he discovers that his poor fiancé has died. There were others who had the same experience along the Platte River. A cattleman named Gene Wilson spotted it in 1887 and saw the body of his wife laid out on a canvas. She too died. In 1903, Victor Hyba was chopping down a tree on his riverfront property when he spied the ship. Laid out on the deck was the body of a close friend. This story repeats over and over again, sighting after sighting, throughout the years. It's difficult to say with accuracy where exactly these events occurred. Some say it happens near the Bessemer Bend of the Platte River, while others say it occurs about six miles south of Guernsey. But every known case was reported in the late fall, and in all cases the person seen upon the deck of the Phantom Ship died on the very same day. So, if you're up in that neck of the woods come autumn, keep your eyes peeled, and you may witness something that many of us X-Files would pay good money to see. This is a story of a mysterious cavern full of gold. It's also the story of the tragic fate connected with it. In New Mexico, there's a dry desert lake known as the Hembrillo Basin, and smack in the middle of that is a craggy outcropping of rock called Victorio Peak, pick related. Long ago, it was home to a vicious Apache chief who waged war against the Texas Rangers and the US military. But that was a long time ago. Nowadays, it belongs to the military. Some might say they stole it from a poor widow named Babe Beckworth, she said the land belonged to her and she had the deed to prove it, but the courts gave it to the military anyway. So how'd Babe even get this piece of land to begin with, you might ask? Well, I'm about to tell you. Back when she was a young woman, Babe was married to a man known as Doc Noss. The two settled down in Hot Springs, New Mexico, which later changed its name to Truth or Consequences, oddly enough. Let me cut to the chase. November 1937, Doc is up near the summit of Victoria Peak. Under a rocky overhang, he's waiting for a storm to die down when he notices a stone near him that looks as if it's been worked in some fashion. Unable to budge it, he digs around the stone until he's able to get his fingers underneath. He lifts it up and what do you know? There's a hole leading straight down into the heart of Victorio Peak. The rain dies down and Doc returns home. He grabs some supplies and heads back up to explore the opening he found. He drops down into the shaft by rope and descends into the mountain nearly 60 feet at which point he drops into a small chamber. There's all sorts of Indian artwork on the walls, and at one end of the chamber the shaft continues downward. Again Doc descends, this time about 125 feet, before the shaft again levels off. Doc has found himself in a very large natural cavern. Now here's where things get really interesting. There are small rooms chiseled out of the rocky cavern wall. Stepping into one, Doc finds a human skeleton. It's kneeling securely tied to a stake driven into the ground. The skeleton's hands are bound behind its back. Doc finds a bunch of these, 27 in total. But that's not all. Doc continues exploring and stumbles upon a hoard of treasure. Coins, jewels, priceless artifacts, old letters and documents. He even finds a gold statue of the Virgin Mary. And that's just the beginning. In a deeper cavern, Doc finds stacks of gold bars, each one weighing over 40 pounds. Doc fills his pockets with gold coins and climbs back up to the surface. Afterward, Doc and Babe spend every free moment exploring the tunnels inside the mountain, living in a tent at the base of the peak. At one point, Doc carries out a crown containing 243 diamonds and one pigeon blood ruby. He also carries the gold bars out very slowly and painstakingly. Now put yourself in their shoes. Two people of modest means falling into a literal gold mine. You'd probably be dreaming of a big fancy house, fancy clothes, nights out at the opera, rubbing elbows with high-class people. But instead, the two run into some serious bad luck. Congress has passed the Gold Act, which outlaws the private ownership of gold. Doc and Babe are unable to sell anything they've found on the open market. From here, things go from bad to worse. Although they manage to establish legal ownership of their find, Doc becomes extremely paranoid and begins stashing gold in areas only he knows about. As a result of his paranoia, his marriage to Babe becomes increasingly strained. Then, more bad luck. Doc hires an engineer to help him open up the shaft which would make accessing the gold much easier. But the blast is a disaster. 
It causes a cave-in and shuts Doc out of his own mind. His marriage with Babe gets even rockier and the two divorce. But this poses another problem for Doc because the mine is still technically in her name, as well as his. Doc can't work the mine without her permission, and he's quickly running out of money. But luckily, or so he thinks, he meets Charles Ryan, a Texas oil man. Ryan tells Doc he'll take $25,000 worth of the gold, and in exchange he'll help Doc reopen the mine. Doc readily agrees, but his paranoia is at an all-time high, and he begins to suspect Ryan of double-crossing him. The two get into an argument and Ryan takes a shot at Doc. It's one single bullet straight to the old cranium and it's lights out. Doc is dead. The poor guy dies with $2.16 in his pocket. Anyway, this leaves Babe the sole owner, but there's more bad luck to come. You see, she and Doc had gone to the state of New Mexico to file a lease on the land. But it turns out the land technically belonged to some guy named Roy Henderson, who leased the land to the military. Babe fought this in court, and the court's decision is funny in a sad sort of way. Their decision? The military only legally has access to the surface of the land, and everything underneath, aka the gold, belongs to Babe. But whoever goes onto the land must get permission from the military, which the military always denies. So they get the land and nobody gets access to it. So unless the military has secretly taken it all, that gold sits there to this day. As for the name House of Then Golden Cave, some people believe that Doc Noss found the Casa del Cueva de Oro, which of course is Spanish for the House of the Golden Cave. You see, I mentioned in passing that Doc found old documents and letters in the cave. One of these was a letter by Pope Pius III, and it was eventually translated. It starts by saying, seven is the holy number, and eventually goes on. In seven languages, seven signs, and languages in seven foreign nations look for the seven cities of gold. 70 miles north of El Paso del Norte in the seventh peak, Soledad. These cities have seven sealed doors, three sealed toward the rising of the sun, three sealed toward the setting of the sun, one deep within Casa del Cueva de Oro at high noon. Receive health, wealth, and honor. Notice the name Soledad. That's actually the former name of Victorio Peak, where Doc found the opening into the mountain in case you've lost track. Believers think that Doc actually found the seventh door located at high noon. Unfortunately for the poor bastard, there was no health, wealth, and honor there. Only a tragic life, a tragic death, and a whole lot of useless gold. Here's an Irishman sharing a few interesting stories about the other crowd. He meanders at first, just laying out the region, then tells the story of a changeling. I come from a small village in Ireland. When I was growing up, the population was somewhere around the 900 mark, and it's over 1600 now. In the early 90s when I was a kid, pretty much every adult had some sort of ghost story. I'm not even kidding. The amount of stuff I was told was ridiculous, sometimes laughable, but quite often terrifying. The main reason for writing to you guys now is to talk about two topics, the hat man and changelings. Just outside my village, there is an old road called the Stump Lane. On the stump lane, there's the ruins of an old house, and beside it is a tree known to the people of that area as the fairy tree. Farther down the lane lives a woman who, when she was a child, used to live in that house by the fairy tree. It's said that she and her family were forced out of the house by the fairies. They say the fairy folk were supposed to be pissed at her father, Mr. Bolger, for building a house by their tree. Apparently, not saying I believe this part, but a hell of a lot of people do, there were several attempts made to chop the tree down, but people were quickly put off by the red blood-like substance that would stream from the cuts made by saws or axes. Down along the middle of the lane, there's a row of about ten houses that are spaced out over a kilometre or so, and two fields back behind these is a place simply known as the Fairy Fort. Note, Fairy Forts are hills said to be the homes of fairies. Farther down the lane then, there is a separate lane that ventures off to an old farm that is owned by the Dunbar family. A story I heard about them that dates back to the 30s is an odd one. I cannot give you names, but one of the children, a young teenager at the time, was out picking blackberries one day for his mother, but didn't return home. It got late, and the mother got very worried. They were a country family in rural Ireland. The children were never out late. She sent her husband and other sons out looking for him, but there was no sign of him. Three weeks went by and they feared the worst, but he did eventually come home, though he was not the same. He came home nursing a sore arm. In fact, one of his hands was deformed 
It had been changed into a baby's hand. He said he was taken by the fairies, and this was not questioned. It was believed to be the absolute truth. The mother and father apparently tried a number of different things to please the fairies in the hope that they would make their son whole again, but the son died sometime in the 80s, if I am remembering correctly, and with one of his hands small and deformed. So that was all just to give you a feel for the area I grew up in. So, the changeling, I'm not sure of the date on this one, but it is said to have happened around the outskirts of the village. The woman who told me about the story of the Dunbars shared this one with me too. She told me a shitload of stories about fairies and was a complete believer in them. This is the story of a young woman who was widowed not long after she had given birth. Now, fending for herself and a baby, she took on a job picking cabbages. Whilst working one day, her baby was sleeping in a basket along one of the drills. Everything was nice and quiet. But when she got home, her baby was different looking, old looking, the same size, but it looked like an old man. She couldn't leave its side. It would scream and shout for her, and not only that, it would curse and say foul things, laughing as it did. Her family came to visit and were disturbed by the baby. It threw bread at them and spat at them, snickering and jeering at them as it did. When they were leaving, the young lady's father brought her outside. The baby screamed like a banshee. The father told her that the thing inside was not her child and that he was going to send the priest out to her. Sure enough, the priest called out to her and he received the same abuse. He told her to leave the thing outside for three days, and no matter how hard it tried to get in, she was to ignore it, for it was not her child anymore. It was one of the fairies. She didn't want to go through with it, but after suffering for weeks, she left the thing outside. It cried like a baby, sobbing and screaming and pleading, Mammy, please let me in, Mammy. Don't leave me out here. I'm scared. For three days and nights, she listened to it bang on the windows, scream for her and weep in ways no person wants to her. But it all stopped. After the third night, there was silence. She opened the door to find that her baby boy had been returned unharmed, safe and grinning happily. So on to the Hat Man. I was really surprised to hear stories of the Hat Man outside of Ireland. I always thought it was based in my county Wexford. I never imagined that it was such a common occurrence across the world. When I was eight years old, I had a pal who was over at my house and he told me something that his father had told him when they were eating dinner the night before. His father was working as a farmhand, and on this day was shearing sheep. He said he got a feeling someone was watching him. He looked around and saw nothing out of the ordinary and continued working. He would again feel a presence around him though, and this time when he turned, he saw a huge man, a man wearing a top hat and what looked like a cloak. He could not make out any features though, he just said that the man was black, he was just all black. My mother happened to be there while my friend was retelling his father's story, and she followed it with a story told to her by my grandmother. My grandmother had often talked about seeing and being followed by a man in a top hat and cloak. Her house was in a little cul-de-sac that was at the back of an old supermarket. There was a shortcut to her house, a small narrow alley that stretched from the store all the way past her house. There were no lights on the actual alley itself, and there were walls on either side. So when it was night, it was really damn dark on that alley. The only light you could see was the light back down at the end that shone from the road where the store was. My grandmother was playing bingo one night, and sure enough, like any other night, she walked up that alley to get home quicker. Halfway up it, she heard footsteps behind her. She stopped and did something she always advised her kids against doing. She turned around to see what was there. There was nothing there. The long, narrow laneway was empty. She began to walk again, and once again she heard something behind her. She turned, this time, the hat man walked out of the shadows and stood tall and menacing, a dark silhouette that almost blocked all the light at the end of the alley. My grandmother told my mother that she asked the man, what do you want, and something else. He didn't answer though, and she just turned back and walked home. I'm not sure if she ever saw him again. She was old school though, hard as nails. The next time I heard something about him, I was about 20, I was having a few pints with a few mates. There was a lock-in, which there normally was, and is, in the pubs in my village. When we sat down at a table where some old stories were being told, a guy got talking. Now this man is as straight as they get, no bullshit kind of guy. A country chap who worked his ass off during the week and enjoyed a pint on the weekends. He said he was walking home one night, it was black dark. 
Man in those days once you walked out of Ferns, my village. There were no lights till the next town or village. So he's walking home when just like my grandmother he heard someone walking behind him. He stopped and looked back. And this happened several times to the point where it sounded like the footsteps were right behind him. He stopped and looked back. Nothing there. He turned back to face the way he was going. When there standing in front of him was a tall man with a top hat. He said the man was jet black, so black that he was even more dark and black than the black night that surrounded him. He was frozen, terrified. The hat man walked past him and said nothing, disappearing into the night. The guy who told us this was visibly shaken by what happened and we even walked him home that night. I heard two other stories about him, but they are different. He is far more aggressive in them and I'm not so sure whether or not I can believe the sources. All the best, peace. This is a pretty funny story from the late 1800s about an argument that led to a very expensive hoax. In 1868, a New York man named George Hull had an argument with a Methodist preacher. Hull was an ardent atheist, and he and the preacher were having a lively disagreement about biblical claims. At one point, the preacher insisted that giants had existed on earth at Knot Point. The preacher pointed to Genesis 6-4. There were giants in the earth in those days. Hull is appalled. How could anyone believe such horse shit? So he decides, I'm going to make a fool of this man, and concocts an elaborate plan. First, he goes to Fort Dodge, Iowa, and purchases an acre of land along Gypsum Creek. Then he hires men there to carve out a huge block of gypsum, telling them it's for a monument to Abraham Lincoln. Then he has the block shipped to Chicago, where he hires a German stonecutter to secretly carve it into the likeness of a man. The German used stains and acids to weather the giant's skin and darning needles to create pores on his body. After that, Hull secretly shipped the carved giant back home to New York, where it was buried on land owned by his cousin. Hull's plan to troll the Methodist preacher was just about ready to be executed. The scheme cost him $2,600, which is about $42,000 in today's money. Then, get this, Hull waits an entire year before doing anything. He just lets go on with his life as though everything is normal. But a year later, he hires a couple of men to dig a well on the spot where the giant carving is buried. Pick related. October 16, 1869. The great discovery is made. No time is wasted. Hull has his cousin set up a tent over the giant. He begins charging 25 cents for people to see it. Naturally, it attracts the attention of scientists, archaeological scholars, and skeptics in general. It's promptly pronounced a fake, but people don't care, and Hull ups the admission charge to 50 cents. By this point, he's seeing that there's more money to be made than he had previously thought, so he sells his part interest in the giant to a group headed by one David Hannum. Hannum had the giant moved to Syracuse, New York for exhibition, drawing huge crowds. Hull made $23,000 off this deal, or almost half a million dollars by today's standards. You may have heard of a little outfit called Barnum and Bailey Circus. Well, the head of it, P.T. Barnum, is interested in the giant and offers $50,000 for it. He's turned down. Pissed, Barnum hires a man to create a replica, which he puts it on display, claiming that Hannum's giant is a fake and that his is the real deal. Not a smooth move on his part. Barnum has just opened himself up to a lawsuit. Sure enough, Hannum sues P.T. Barnum for calling his giant a fake. However, George Hull has had fun and decides to come clean. He explains that it's all a hoax. The court then rules that Barnum can't be sued for calling a fake giant a fake. Go figure. One last bit of trivia. When Hannum was asked about Barnum's giant, Hannum shook his head and said something that became something of a common phrase in America. There's a sucker born every minute. Nowadays, that quote is mistakenly attributed to Barnum, supposedly in reference to his gullible crowds. There was one story that I still think about sometimes, in which a black dog appears in two different churches, several miles apart, and attacks the parishioners inside. It's 1570, and a terrible storm is raging on a Sunday morning. The townspeople are attending church and the building physically shakes as the thunder and lightning crashes outside. The doors and windows, shut against the howling winds, seem to groan. Suddenly there's a gasp and someone points to the back of the church. A very large, very fearsome-looking black dog is standing there. No one is sure how he got in with the doors tightly closed, but the beast begins walking down the aisle to the front of the church. The people are frozen stiff as the dog approaches one person and simply nudges him on the arm. 
He pads over to a different person and does the same. As he's walking over to a third person, the two people touched by the dog slump over in their pews as though dead. Nonetheless, everyone is apparently too terrified to move. The black dog nudges the third person and disappears. To everyone's surprise and disgust, the third person touched by the dog suddenly shrivels up before their eyes. He curls in on himself like a drawn-up purse, according to those present. On the same morning, seven miles away in a different church, the same beast appears. Three different people are killed here, and the dog pushes open the church doors closed against the storm and speeds off into the pouring rain. Afterwards, a weather vane was placed up in the marketplace near where this occurred. It depicts a hound, and it's still there today, pick related. Anyone interested in a country music ghost story? It's short and sweet. Johnny Horton was a country singer who not only seemed to have predicted his own demise, but apparently made contact with a friend after death. Pick related, Johnny Horton. Just weeks before his death, Horton had been backstage at an event with his pal, Merle Kilgore. He shared a troubling premonition with his friend about his impending death. Horton believed he would be killed in an accident related to a drunken man, though he wasn't sure how. He thought perhaps he'd be shot in a drunken argument. And when Horton was performing at the Skyline Club in Austin, Texas, he stayed away from the bar as much as he could. The following night, he and his band were driving near Milano, Texas. Horton was behind the wheel and the trio were approaching a bridge outside of town when a drunk driver in a pickup truck swerved into Horton's lane. He plowed right into Horton, injuring everyone in the car. Horton, however, was dead. Sometime later, Merle Kilgore told a strange tale. According to him, John Horton had told him something on the night that the two men had been backstage together. The last night Kilgore saw Horton alive. I want to see Horton, had said, if it's possible to reach you from the other side. Horton had told his friend that he would contact him using a strange, almost nonsensical phrase that only he would recognize. The drummer is a rummer and he can't keep the beat. It took seven years, but Kilgore finally received that message. There was a phone call at his home one evening from a man with a northeastern accent. The man claimed to be a member of a small group of spiritualists based in Greenwich Village, New York. He said that during a seance, his group had been visited by the spirit of a cowboy who called himself Wharton. This ghost cowboy had a very peculiar message that he wanted them to relay to a man named Kilgore. A local radio DJ had helped them discover the Kilgore-Horton friendship, and they got Kilgore's number through his associate who knew the station manager. Mr. Kilgore, the spirit of Johnny Horton said to tell you, the drummer is a rummer and he can't keep the beat. Kilgore dropped the phone at this point, his eyes searching the room. He said aloud, Johnny, I got your message, Johnny. It's a comforting thought and makes for a cozy ghost story in my opinion. Pick related, Merle Kilgore. This one is a famous legend from Mexico. I shared it a while ago in a Mexico thread, but it fits here. El Charo Negro, the black horseman, is a man who rides a black horse. Pick related, an example of a charo. When it's your time to die, El Charo Negro rides up to your home and tells you that you must go away with him. However, he isn't the grim reaper or death itself. He's the spirit of a cowboy, so he is sometimes persuaded to let you live if you provide him with the proper incentive. Many people say cigars and mezcal can convince him to leave you be. Here's how you do it. Offer him a seat when he shows up. Pour him a drink and hand him a cigar and he will tell you his entire story and all of the different things he is required to do in the afterlife. He'll tell you all these things and chat pleasantly just as if you were two strangers who met in a bar. The conversation is likely to last many hours. If you're lucky, and he enjoys himself. He will leave when the mezcal is gone. But before he goes, he'll say to you, I'll come back again someday. Maybe then we can enjoy more drinks and more long conversations. Then he'll ride away, and you can live to see another day. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time.